Hello and welcome to the Womb Centered Healing Podcast. I'm Sama Morningstar and I have Freya McFarlane here with me today. Thank you for joining us, Freya. Um, I met, yeah, I met Freya for, through uh, the Blood Love group, I believe, wasn't it? Uh, Hannah Bora Baby who introduced us, or was it um, one of the other gals from that group? Yeah, I think it was Hannah. Uh huh. And um, she was telling me about some of your um, blood mysteries, alchemical work with the blood mysteries. Mm -hmm. And I was really curious to learn more about what what you have been. I think you were doing a part of a course that that she was putting together or something like that. And she was telling me about it. And I said, I really want to talk to this Freya gal. <laughs> See what you're up to. Um, and I'm sure my audience would be very curious and interested to hear about um, what you've been practicing, what you've been developing, what you've been remembering, what you, what you've had passed down perhaps from your mentors um, mm. with this, because we all know that our, our menstrual blood is a powerful alchemical, um, the, just the ble bleeding process, the cyclical um, quality of our bodies really connects us with the cyclical quality of nature, of Mother Earth, and mm. the, the power, the inherent power in that. Um, I find that anything cyclical, it, it just becomes this generator of energy. Mm. And um, I just, I have sort of my own instinctual practices that I do around that. And talking with you about how you have perhaps made that um, have articulated that in in unique ways and we can learn from each other and support each other I'd love to hear more about it so I'd love for you to introduce yourself and share um, a little bit more about yourself and perhaps share about your journey with this um, blood mysteries alchemical practices mm. Thank you so much. I just want to say it's such a pleasure to be in this space and to really open up the dialogue around the, the blood alchemies and the, the magic of our, our wounds and what we have to offer ourselves and our communities as women. Um, for me, this has been the deepest calling to connect with my womb, connect with this, this energy. And um, I'm, from, I'm from the UK. Uh, my, my family are all from a little town called Stroud, which isn't far from Glastonbury. So I was very much brought up around the priestess energy and connecting with the energies of Avalon. And I'm very lucky to be second generation womb witch um, to have had numerous initiations from my, my aunt and, uh, and my own mother. Um, they deeply, deeply understood the importance of connecting with our blood and yeah, it's really transpired into a deep connection for me and been passed on as work for me to continue within, uh, within my life. Mm -hmm. So now I, I live in Canada, uh, in Toronto, but I offer, I offer support to women all over the world through courses, through online coaching, and um, I run retreats and workshops around womb awakening, wild womb awakening. And Hannah Borough Baby and I started um, an online Facebook platform for women from all over the world to share, which is called the Global Sisterhood of Blood Mysteries. And um, Hannah invited me earlier this year to join one of the first online seminar series on the blood mysteries of virtual voyage of blood mysteries and I really feel that now is the time to begin and, and reawakening that which is innately within us 
Um, there are just so so much interest. There's, there's such a bubbling sense that uh, this is the right time. And I remember when I was younger, talking to my aunts about it. It was it was very small, um, and they were doing the women's circles and exploring blood mysteries, but it, it definitely hadn't mushroomed out at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they used to tell me stories about some of the things that the women in Glastonbury would do and it was wild, really wild. Um, connecting on, on the hills and doing these rituals in front of the tour. The sacred feminine is deeply, deeply alive in that space. Mm. And I feel blessed to continue connecting with that frequency. Mm. Yeah. Well, I certainly felt it when I was uh, visiting there last year yeah. I, and, and my womb felt it, you know, as soon as I got uh -huh. to Avalon, I started bleeding way earlier than oh. I would have normally been bleeding. And mm -hmm. I immediately, you know, first, one of the first things I wanted to go, go walk up the tour. And there mm -hmm. I found wild nettles growing at the base of the tour, which does, uh, it's too dry where I live for wild nettles. Uh, I, there are some spots, but it's not just like everywhere, like it was up there. <laughs> and I just was, you know, I just made an offering of my blood immediately to the wild nettles um, there sort of in the back field on the way up to the tour. And it just was so natural to, commune there and with the chalice well I'm sure some listeners have heard me speak about that how the water comes out and turns everything red it really feels like the, the yeah. mother earth is menstruating right there and it really does and one of the things that my aunts used to tell me is that uh, there are there is a, a very powerful rock inside the ruins of the Glastonbury Cathedral where women have been going for generations to bleed onto this rock. It's like an acupressure point to return the blood and the sacred feminine to the earth. And my aunt, even when it was allowed, just used to go in, find this rock and just be wearing these fantastic long skirts and they would sit on the rock with their underwear off and bleed directly onto the stone. And um, since hearing this when I was a girl, I've heard about uh, different communities all over the world that have these traditions of setting aside a bleeding rock mm -hmm. to continually return that energy to the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a little creek in the town where I live and I, I'm mm -hmm. feeling like there's going to be a rock there <laughs> that needs to yes. be the rock. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's a powerful thing. One of, the, one of the things that my aunts have always spoken about is the need to bring back community blood shrines and to, to activate the, the frequency of um, the, the crystalline portals through through the blood mystery so um i've started to create these crystal blood portals wherever i go um as community offerings so i did one in thailand with a group of women uh on kopangan and we just created this blood shrine for a whole month together whilst we were in community and all of the women would just go down to the blood shrine when they were bleeding and make their offerings and mm. just connect really deeply. Mm. And I've never felt so woven into the fabric of a woman's face than when I am in communion with a, a blood shrine that's created in unity with others. Mm. Beautiful. Oh. I'm getting all kinds of inspirations. <laughs> I hope so. I would love to see the Community Blood Shrine Project just wave out across the world. Mm -hmm. You know, just a place where women know that whatever's happening, whatever time of year it is, 
whether there's a ritual going on or an open red tent or not, you can just go quietly and or not quietly and offer up your blood and it's totally received and you know that that is a sacred held space for that offering. Mm -hmm. So how do you, I'm just curious about the practicalities of it. Do you find a place in nature and then you just let people know this is a, a, a you know, or is it on, or have, you know, is it in public property or how do you, how do you set it up? This, so I set one up in Thailand and Bali and then in, in the UK in my hometown as well. And generally they're in spaces that, uh, that are private. Mm -hmm. So that, that there's a guardian um, who is the keeper of the blood shrine. Usually it's in an, a garden that's accessible and someone has made, made that space available to the community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would love to to you open it up in a more public way, mm -hmm. maybe out of the back of a, some kind of community center that were open-minded to this kind of work uh, rather than it being on private property mm -hmm. um but i think that's that's a conversation for uh, for the right people yeah mm -hmm. well i could certainly make something in in my yard i have plenty of river rocks um, yeah, yeah yeah and then but i also have um you know there's creeks that run through mm -hmm. pu public spaces here that are you're you're still in the town but you're mm -hmm. sort of the creek is not anybody's private property um, yeah. and it, but it gets washed away every year. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the creek comes through the really strong in the winter, in the rainy season and yeah. it changes the landscape pretty much mm -hmm. completely, but I might be able to find a spot and ceremonially set it up. Um, ooh, we're getting me out. Oh. It. It's part of the vision that, that I had is, uh, creating a beautiful crystal grid and then um, using rose quartz uh, to, to actually pierce the ground and then offering the blood in and creating creating a little acupoint to just keep going keep, keep offering these then um, these little medicinal offerings to the earth mm. with the crystal I yeah. see. So you bring crystals and ceremonially with an initial initiatory group of women yeah. make, make a, 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 make grid a grid and, mm -hmm. and take a pointy yeah. rose quartz and maybe make one, one central or a, num a number of different spots where you might want to. I usually, I usually work with the 13 moons grid initially. And then from that, I kind of tune into what is the land that I'm creating the crystal blood grid on asking for. Mm -hmm. So I might um, connect with Mugwort. Mugwort is an amazing hub for, for dreaming. And I will, I'll spend some time downloading, dreaming into the land, feeling the land. If I can, I'll actually sleep really close to where we're planning to create the, the crystal grid. Mm -hmm. and um and feel into it as much as possible so for instance when i created the grid with the community in thailand we were on a crystal island which was filled with rose uh, not rose uh, crystals um quartz crystals and we went onto the beach and we we collected loads of crystals to to be a part of the ceremony and that felt really powerful to be in direct uh, connection with what is available on the land that we're on here. Mm -hmm. So it might be different for wherever people are on, on the globe and what kind of crystals want to be involved. I really believe in local resourcing as much as possible. Well, it's interesting because there's a particular type of crystal that's indigenous to this area because there are so oh. many um, it's a volcanic area and so there's a lot of waters volcanic waters that come through and I think I feel like that's what is you know the hot water and the minerals and everything makes crystals and so there's these crystals called Lake County diamonds that um, you can find in the local area I haven't found any yet but that's been also an inspiration of mine to go 
somewhere in the county where I know we can yeah. find those Lake County diamonds. Wow. But but what we do have plenty of is river rocks. So I'm feeling like perhaps making a grid yeah. with these river rocks where okay. um, w women can sit on the rocks themselves, like you were yeah. saying initially, yeah. where it's a, a bleeding stone, and that um, and then as I connect more with the with the Lake County diamonds. Ooh, this is fun. <laughs> right? The part of um part of the blood alchemies is really about working with minerals, working with rocks, working with um different alchemical processes to really charge up these these items, these assets. And um this leads in really nicely to talking about what is the power of working with crystals and blood. Um, when I was on Kofangang for the first time, this, this beautiful crystal just put itself right in my path. I picked it up and it said, I'm your blood crystal. I was like, oh, okay. And ever since then, this crystal has want, just really clearly wanted me to offer my blood to it every single month. So this crystal is charged with about four years worth of, of blood energy. Wow. And I placed it in the, under the moon. And I placed it into spring water. And it, it is my, my womb. It is an external energetic representation of my womb. Mm. And as I started to work with the, the crystal grids, um, different, different energies from different crystals started to present themselves. So working with rose quartz and my blood, leaving a rose quartz crystal in a little pot of my blood for 24 hours mm. with some rose essence under the moon and then meditating with that, woo, magic. Woo, oh. magic. So yeah. I, you know, I'm, this is adding a whole nother dimension to some right? of the alchemical <laughs> practices that I've done because I've worked with plants mostly and I do have yes. a ceramic bowl. I didn't make the bowl, but it's a handmade bowl that I purchased specifically for this purpose. And that's where, that's how I transport my blood and make offerings of my blood. And I use, I, I give it mostly to my rose bushes in the garden mm -hmm. and they're on a grid uh, i made a labyrinth in the garden of course the plants have taken over there's no walking this labyrinth it's like <laughs> there's several plants <laughs> that are like the queen and the queens of the garden and they they have free reign so <laughs> yeah. you know but in any case so using that that special bowl feels like some of that mineral quality and then i do have some crystals that it feels like perhaps as you're talking now might want to get involved in this process. Absolutely. Yeah. And working with um, different, different bowls with different frequencies is also another aspect of how I work with the alchemy. Mm. So for, for instance, um, if I am wanting to, if I'm on my moon for instance, and I want to connect with uh, galactic star energy, I will put my blood into a crystal bowl um, and that I just hold that in my hand and then I ring it. So I work a lot with healing, um, healing bowls and my blood to, to activate the energetic frequency around my auric field and my, around my home and to kind of bathe me in my blood energy. And then if I'm wanting to go deeper down into Gaia, into the earth, um, to connect with shamanic ancestral energy, I work with copper. So Tibetan bowls with my blood in, chiming that away, sends you right down if you're feeling disconnected from um, from earth energies. Yeah. And then there are all sorts of other frequencies, like for instance, you can you can work with a wooden bowl, um, ideally hand carved mm -hmm. with some some blood in it, and and just do a little spiral into the wood with your fingertips and then you'll start to connect with the, the mythical elven woodland creatures. Mm. So there are all these different places that you can go to just by feeling into, okay, what are the, what are the dimensions that are accessible through working with different minerals and aspects? Mm. So the bowl itself, the, the, what the bowl is made of, 
Um, yeah. So copper, can other metals be used too? I know, I think I have one, I, I think it's brass. I think I have a bowl. Yeah, um, brass again has a, um, a very ancient, old, earthy energy. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes work with silver. Silver has a lot of upward energy that's like galactic. Um, gold is great for working with Egyptian energy. Mm. If you can find a gold bowl with Isis on it, and then you cover that in blood, it's great. It's really, Ooh. really good. So you're I, talking solid gold bowl or just painted gold, or like you're talking actually made of gold? I mean, if you can get it actually made of gold, but... <laughs> not necessary okay <laughs> but just the color gold with isis yeah i've got perhaps. a i've got a plated gold plated um, gold uh -huh. gold with isis on it <laughs> okay so it might be copper or something else on the inside but it's plated yeah. gold on the outside yeah uh -huh. yeah wow i've worked mostly with copper if i'm honest and that has served me really well in working with sex magic alchemies as well so if you put semen blood into the copper as a triad and then make an offering with that that is some potent opportunity for sex magic right there mm -hmm. yeah great and so so when you make an offering it sounds like you might have any number of intentions or mm -hmm. prayers or um gifts could you talk a little bit about that like how how do you you know what kind of inspirations do you get for these alchemical offerings processes are you are you having an intention about something you're wanting to create sometimes or heal are you asking are you working with healing energies or yeah share about some of perhaps maybe some of your personal experiences of um how these ceremonial practices interweave in activities that are going on in your life that you're supporting with mm -hmm. these these practices uh, the practices are always woven into my life and um, the reason why i'm so interested in the alchemical processes is because then i'm not limited to that kind of magic just when I'm bleeding. So for instance, my stone is, is always with me and I can always access that, that vibration mm -hmm. um, to help amplify my, my womb-centered universe energy if I want to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I create tinctures. I create a lot of different tinctures with a lot of different crystals and a lot of different essential oils and herbs. And those I can um, start to explore um, different practices, offerings to trees, offerings to, to my blood shrine. I have an active blood shrine that, that's always, um, always alive in my home. And uh, intention setting is, is very changeable. Um, I make a lot of offerings for the awakening of the divine feminine. And I make a lot of offerings to support a community and being able to come into its power around um, discovering its womb-centric awareness. Um, sometimes I work with abundance. Uh, sometimes it's about, about health and clarity. So asking my blood and my womb to, to show me what I'm not seeing and allow me to um, to open up my my consciousness beyond what is visible to me, mm -hmm. I believe that the womb has a depth of insight and awareness that is way beyond uh, our understanding. So when I make an offering, I'm I'm asking for support, and I I, I join that that asking of support with um, with the work I do around the Ascended Masters. I work with Isis and Mary Magdalene uh, to, to help illuminate uh, consciousness with me. Mm -hmm. And these offerings are very much to them um, in connection with the earth. Mm -hmm. I remember 
the very first time I went and directly made an offering on Sphere. It was 20 or something. Uh, it was raining. I just really wanted to go outside. It was 12 o'clock at night. I just walked up to the farm behind my mum's house. There was a cow mooing right next to me, and I just squatted down, no knickers on, skirt, and I just led onto the earth. And then I felt this this huge bolt of energy move straight up my spine and through through my womb. And it said, "When women return their blood to the earth, there will be peace on earth." And I've come to understand that to be a very um, widely received message from Gaia that when we can understand what we truly are as women and what what we have within us, then we can begin to awaken the true depth of consciousness on earth. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bit of a roundabout answer, but... (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's, it's wonderful because as you seem to be sharing about and what my experience is as well, is that as we um, connect with this, with our blood mysteries, energies, and our own personal intentions, pretty soon it weaves our personal intentions with that of the collective and the whole human species. I mean, I, my experience of the, and, and the whole planet and, and, and Gaia, you know, it, it, the, the womb energies is very much carrying for everyone, taking care of everyone and everything. And it's this divine mother energy. And as we connect with that, it, it's not, I'm not, I no longer can just take care of myself and let everyone else fend for themselves. It turns into this yeah. collective, let's take, make sure everyone's taken care of and has their needs met and that we're helping the whole planet and the whole species to evolve and to grow and to develop. Um, so that's really wonderful to hear you saying those things too. And I wanted to just ask some kind of specific nitty gritty questions because for me, you know, sometimes I have the opportunity to go outside without any knickers and bleed directly mm-hmm. on the earth. But most often I have a busy life and I have, am doing things. And sometimes I can free bleed, but other times I just, I need to capture my blood and then I work with it yeah. later. And so that's often what I use the, the womb bowl for is to, you know, take whatever I've captured my blood in and, and rinse it out into the bowl and then um, take it outside. And and I'm seeing myself perhaps pouring that bowl onto the stone or in, you know, into some of the areas that we might um, uh, be creating a grid with crystals or things like that, or, or soaking those crystals in that water that I may have infused with the blood. But that's, that's probably you probably if you're making a tincture are you using your blood for that and are, do you need to use fresh blood and is that i mean how, how does that work yeah so um for tincture making you really need the fresh stuff uh-huh. um and it's not it, it's very important that you catch the the mid flow point mm-hmm. so if you're too early on it's um it's still getting ready and it's slightly brown and it hasn't quite, it's not as fresh. Mm-hmm. And then at the end it's, it's tithering off and it's again, not as fresh. And mm-hmm. you, you can smell it, you know, right. when you're in the middle of your flow and it's really that deep red, mm-hmm. but um, it's almost rosy. I don't know if everyone smells roses. Mine smells of roses. Ah. Um, <laughs> For real. And um, and then as soon as I, I take it out, so I use a moon cup, mm-hmm. as soon as I take it out, I put it into a little bottle. And then I have some, um, some spring water that I add in. So I do about half blood, half spring water. And then I put about 15 drops of essential oils in, different essential oils, depending on what I want to work with. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I'm working with frankincense and Sometimes I'm working with rose. I love working with the divine feminine. I feel extremely connected to the rose energy. Um, I add a little, I usually add one drop of 
tea tree to help it to uh, to, to not smell basically and uh, and it it holds I've got tinctures that are two three years old and they don't smell so you haven't added any alcohol you haven't added any glycerin no preservative except the essential oils the 15 drops yeah so um, sometimes and how big I, is the bottle that you're doing it's about 50 Sometimes it's 30 mil, sometimes it's 50 mil. Um, sometimes I do use alcohol. If mm. I know that I'm going to be keeping it out of the fridge, mm. then I'll use alcohol. Um, I use alcohol when I'm doing blood and semen mixtures. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I also do apple cider vinegar. That works just as well. Mm -hmm. I try to avoid using alcohol. I've never really been into alcohol tinctures, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really a, it's an experimentation. It's mm -hmm. trying things out. My favorite way to preserve though is dehydration. Um, and I just get a, get a piece of, um, a, a baking tray with the, the baking mat on it. Or was it, lost my word. Yeah. Baking mat. <laughs> like and parchment the, paper? Are you talking about parchment, parchment paper? paper. Uh -huh. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> and um, and I put the oven on as low as possible, and I actually leave the door open because you want to keep the heat as low as possible. It's like when you're doing dehydrating; you don't want to extract too many of the nutrients. Right. And you'll know if you've gone too high because it will it will go very dark. Mm -hmm. It should stay burgundy, only slightly darker than my top. Mm -hmm. And then once it's complete, um, you just pop it into a pestle and mortar, grind it up. You don't need to add any essential oils. Don't put anything wet in it and then put it straight into a little bottle. And that will not smell. And that, but that's, yeah. it stays dry. You haven't added any liquid. You just got a powder. And so with these tinctures, are you using them for anointing? Are you taking them internally? What are you doing with them? I never take them internally, not the, okay. um, no. Um, I, I make offerings to my blood shrine. I make offerings to trees. Uh -huh. um, I do do anointing sometimes. And um, that, that has been really powerful. When I was, I was away recently on a trip and I left a bottle of, um, a tinctured bottle of blood for my partner. He was feeling disconnected from me during my during my cycle um and I asked him please go to the fridge and and just anoint yourself on your heart but I wrist and uh solar plexus with my blood and wow he just had such a strong opening of feeling my womb and feeling me and our love because he is my my divine partner and then my blood holds so much of his energy and mm. our energy infused together. Mm. He was able to feel all that yumminess that we, we share. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Wow. That my partner's out of town right now too. So, uh -huh. so I'm feeling like, Oh, perhaps next time if he goes or if I go, we Send can. Him with some blood. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, and so Love you're it. using the cup now. I know. Yeah. For some women, the cup doesn't work for various reasons. Yeah. Myself included. I, my, the cup, and Fair enough. don't agree. Uh, I, that might change, you know, as I uh, practice various things. But um, so far, I haven't found a cup that <laughs> really worked mm -hmm. for me. And so I, what I've done is just sat on a bowl to yeah. capture my blood but uh, you know I'd have to sit there for a while unless I'm having like a flood for a second you know <laughs> but um do you have any other suggestions for somebody who might not want to be using their uh, a cup um I mean you could definitely use one of the pads so if you know you want to, to tincture mm -hmm. then um maybe in your heaviest flow you put a fresh pad in leave it in for 90 minutes mm -hmm. and then wring it out because you're going to be using water anyway. Okay. Um, so then you would, that would also work the amount of water, a small amount of water just to take yeah, the blood you would out. Get okay. a, you would get, get a smaller tincture out mm -hmm. of it than mm -hmm. if you were using a moon cup, but the essence of it would still be there. Mm -hmm. 
And what I recommend is also get um, feeling into a crystal that you really connect with and then putting that crystal inside the bottle mm. to percolate with your blood. Mm. That's really powerful. And then mm. sometimes I do mix, uh, mixing herbs, not just essential oils, but I'll, I'll put some, some roses inside um, to connect as well. Mm -hmm. And I like to use a dropper bottle. You can find whatever bottles you, you like, but yeah. the dropper bottle feels really nice because then you can just really make an offering and you can do grid, grid work with it. Mm -hmm. um, that feels great. Yeah. And so that having it in a dropper bottle that you've pre-prepared with charging it with the crystal and the flowers or the you know herbs, the roses, yeah. then that gives you more of a precision with your grid when you go to the shrine exactly. and things like that. Exactly. Beautiful. And another aspect that I work with in alchemy is um, labeling. So every cycle has an essence to it, something that you're, um, you're releasing in the first day and a half and then something that you're calling in in the next day and a half. Mm -hmm. So if you can fine tune the awareness in every cycle of what what is it I've released and what is it I've called in and then um, imbue your tincture with that energy as much as you can. I mean it'll already be imbued but so you label each month your tincture and then after a while you start to build this collection of um, tinctures that all have different frequencies. So maybe one month you're working with abandonment. Mm -hmm. your partner's gone out of town and suddenly all your childhood stuff around abandonment comes up and you get the opportunity to do some work around that mm -hmm. um maybe six months down the line that might come up again and you can work with that that tincture to help reconnect you to the work you did back then and mm -hmm. that's been super powerful for me wow. to have that that train of, of connection to my previous leads Wow, such a rich yeah. practice. Uh, yeah. Freya, I really appreciate you sharing all of this with us. Now, did, was this, you know, this is quite a developed practice for you. And I'm curious mm -hmm. if your mother and your aunts were doing it this, this much. Had they received that from their, um, their mentors in their family or did they remember the, these practices and have you remembered more? Um, I would say I'm very into the alchemy. Mm -hmm. um, my family shared with me how to, how to, the, well, the lifestyle. I remember my aunt saying that she used to go on these hikes when she was at the height of her moon and just wear hiking boots and a skirt and allow the blood to just stream down to the ground and allow everything to just be covered and she would enjoy that wild primal connection mm. when she was alone in the woods um and my my aunts would always offer their blood back to the earth but they never really talked much about the rituals that they did mm. my aunt lives in santa cruz and she has her own red tent Space that she runs there and I'd love to connect more with what she's doing these days. But they were the ones who invited me into the Red Tent and uh, shared with me what happens inside when I was still a teenager. Mm. So, where did you get the inspiration to make a tincture, for example, and, and some of these recipes you've been sharing about? Did you have other mentors or did you just? No, to do it really i remember the first time i was interested in drinking my blood mm -hmm. i was about 21 i was studying midwifery at a very conventional school in the nhs in the uk and i just pulled out my moon cup i pretty much always use the moon cup and i looked at my blood and i smelled it and it smelled so good and i just drank it i didn't even think about it whoa what did I just do <laughs> and the the energy was so powerful but then I started researching um whether this something that other people did I, I pretty much just came across vampire websites mm. this was this was over a decade ago 
mm-hmm. wasn't that much around then. And tinctures and alchemies, no, it's been something I've been developing by myself uh, for a long time. Mm-hmm. I haven't really had other mentors around this area of work, other than my own family and my own connection to source and intuition, feeling, feeling it in, feeling it out. Wow. And, and then my womb has been my teacher. your womb, isn't that how it is for so many yeah. of us? It, it, it <laughs> becomes a remembering, I feel, um, at, you know, we, we feel like we're, we're sort of following our intuition. Um, I also feel like we're following our memory, our ancient cellular memory, just like you just drinking your cup before you even realized what was going on. That, that sounds like this all the cells in your body just said, okay, we're doing this now, you know, <laughs> just bypass the thinking mind and let's go. Right. <laughs> and so, it took four or five years before I met anyone else who was practicing doing anything mm-hmm. similar to what I was up to. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I had to keep it in secrecy. Uh, I remember once my midwifery mentor found one of my blood cups. I'd left it in the bathroom because I didn't want to waste it down the toilet. She screams down the hallway, Freya, what about this bed? This is the hospital. I'm absolutely mortified by me collecting my blood. Um, wow. That kind of drove it underground for a few years uh-huh. until I realized that it wasn't something to be ashamed of. Right, right. And yeah. then probably you had to sort of, ha- you know, have a wisdom about, okay, where is it okay for this to be seen and shared and where is yeah. it going to cause more trouble than it's worth and better just you know keep it to myself Absolutely. <laughs> definitely although there there was there was a sadness that came up to me when i was working in midwifery mm-hmm. i felt that the number of women coming in expecting to have this deep connection with their wombs and their 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 whole body to bring this being into the world it's tough i really think it's it's very challenging Mm -hmm. when you've ignored your your period ignored your womb ignored Mm -hmm. your sexuality ignored your own personal needs around um around that part Mm -hmm. to then build this intimate relationship to bring life into the world it's a challenge it is and and there's so many things going on with that when the society isn't supporting women basic, uh, with basic needs, right? So that there's this yeah. sort of survival function uh, first, right? This survival focus, I guess, is the better term of like, okay, how do I make sure all my basic needs are met? And, mm-hmm. and so that taking the time to deeply connect and have ceremony and and be initiated and remember i mean that takes a quite a good deal of slowing down and so it's it's very much a a privileged few who has, uh, still at this point uh, i feel very privileged to have a lifestyle that allows me to slow down and yeah. um, having chosen not to have children really allows me to slow down uh, because it is a very privileged few women it is. that um, have the the ability to to really um, slow down enough in that that pregnancy path to mm-hmm to really deepen that. But although there are women that are finding their way there and I love supporting women to do so. Um, but you know, I had one, uh, potential client who wanted to do this whole, you know, initiatory birth preparation process. And then, and then she came back to me and told me what she had to pay monthly for her prenatal visits at the birth center. And, I was like, oh yeah, no wonder this is a struggle for you because I mean, then to then pay me on top of that for, mm-hmm. you know, my support and services was like, okay, how, you know, where was she, where was the money coming from? You know, <laughs> like, I totally get it. It's, it's, uh, lifestyle is a, is a big one that yeah. um, I talk about a lot in my programs too. And 
So some of my clients have actually taken to educating their uh, their employers about the benefits of giving them time out when they're on their moon. Mm. It's really inspiring. Mm-hmm. Educating them and letting them know, hey, if I if I take three days off when my moon comes and I put in extra hours uh, in the four days leading up to my moon, then my productivity levels on an overall are going to go up by mm-hmm. this amount. Um, so that's, that's kind of reframed it for me in mm-hmm. what is possible if we look at our, um, our lifestyle and, and try to identify where could I possibly give myself the space to uh, meet my needs so that I can be a better mother, I can be a, a better employee or, or mm-hmm. just be in a better state of health to be able to carry out my, right. my life and support those who need me. Oh man, I'll never forget the first uh, month that I actually did just really kind of force myself really to just rest for three days straight, even though after the second day, you know, by the second or third day, I'm ready to get up and get going again. I'm like, no, I'm going to try this, right? And just rest. And I just spent three days on the couch. That ovulation, I, there was one day right around ovulation after those three days of rest, I couldn't believe what I accomplished. Just completely effortlessly, the day just flowed. It, I like had, I don't, my husband came home and I listed all the things that I had done. And he's like, what? <laughs> you did what? And I'm just like, yeah, I had a great day. Like I wasn't exhausted or anything. He's like, how did you accomplish all of that? I'm like, you know, those three days resting, I think that had something to do with it, you know? In no other, um, in no other function that the body creates for us, would we continue working at the pace we do if we were bleeding? If, if we suddenly started bleeding out of our wrists, the amount right. that no, we let we out of our wimps, we wouldn't, we wouldn't work that yeah, much. But because there's a social taboo around it, we mm-hmm. have this expectation that we need to continue. Mm-hmm. And we don't realize that we're actually killing our productivity yeah. in other areas of our life and depleting ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we could go on and on on this topic for a while, <laughs> but I, I've, said, I've talked about this a lot on this podcast. So um, I want to just say I fully support and send out the prayer and the intention that we all receive this message of the importance of resting during our menstrual period. So Please. we'll just clarify that that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Wonderful. And it's one of the things that um, has really helped me in uh, giving myself permission is sharing that time with, with other sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, there's, there's no longer an excuse of there's no one else around here. We have mm-hmm. online platforms. You can join the Global Sisterhood of Blood Mysteries. And mm-hmm. there's, there's women from all over the world sharing about their a ritual during that time of the month and sharing the vulnerability, sharing the intensity that can come up around uh, around the moon cycle. Mm-hmm. There's always connection. Mm-hmm. And, uh, there are others trying to make it work too. And then for me, sometimes what I need most is solitude. Yeah. And just yeah. quiet and just retreat, and, you know, mm-hmm. away from everyone even other sisters sometimes i just need that solitude and giving my permission myself permission to have that oh my goodness <laughs> and sometimes that to me that retreat is going and sitting on the toilet if i've got if i do have a really busy month because i can't always give myself the gift sure. mm-hmm. three solid days but i i try and every day that i'm on my moon to give myself little pieces mm-hmm. whenever yeah. possible and i'll just sit on the toilet I'll just close my eyes, place my hands on my heart, one hand on my womb, and I'll just say, hey, I love you. Mm -hmm. I'm here. And I'll just loop my awareness back into my womb and give myself those loving, tranquil breaths of connection. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Ah. (sighs) Well, thank you so much, Freya. If, If anyone wants to get in touch with you, do you have a best way that they might reach out to you? Yeah, I'm I'm on Instagram, mm-hmm. Freya McFarlane, 
you'll mm-hmm. find me there mm-hmm. and you can also follow me on my my business page um also under Freya McFarlane mm-hmm. and um the Facebook group I've mentioned the Global Sisterhood um a flood mysteries group really beautiful platform for for learning and growing yeah i'm available for for coaching and sessions and um, online practices wonderful thank you so much freya and um, those of you listening who are also curious about the womb centered healing temple which this podcast is a part of you can go to wombcenteredhealing.com and uh, learn more about what's on offer there as well so thanks again uh, Freya for joining us and um, that's all for now until next time